So, welcome to the podcast, Wally McCallum. How are you, sir? Are you well? I'm good, thank you. At the moment, yeah, I'm still yeah. trying to dodge the virus, so, so uh, far, so good. It's had such an effect on the piping scene this last while, you know, it's like, I don't know anyone that it hasn't affected in some ways. I'm sure it's affected yourself too, as you say, trying to avoid it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, just being careful, and of course, the you know, the, the sort of life in general is completely different than it was two right. years ago this time. So, yeah, it's um, invent- it's really affected the piping and drumming world hugely, oh, sure. of course. Yeah, oh, we'll get into all of that. Uh, plus, we have you on this week's show for a very good reason. Of course, this week, as as we all know, is now Glenfiddich week. <laughs> We're building up to one of the biggest solo piping championships in the whole season, and we'll talk to you about that in a wee second or two. But first of all, I want to kind of get some advice from you we had a load of questions from the big rab show team and we want to quiz you uh, for some pearls of wisdom now you've been famously quoted as saying before that you never stop learning and that you've never really mastered the instrument and that you're constantly learning um have you any tips for anyone who is learning how to pipe at the moment you know for anything that they should pay particular attention to i think probably if you look at um piping at any level i think the the instrument itself is huge you know because um what you what you play it doesn't matter what you play in terms of the quality of it but if you play on a poor instrument it kind of undoes all the good you've done in your practice so i think probably when you're really beginning it's more about the finger work and that kind of stuff but as you progress on the pipes always try you know to learn as much as you can about how the instrument works and get it to as good a standard as you can get it and that's of, of course setting up and blowing and trying trying different reads and combinations of all sorts of chanters bags and everything that's it so it comes down to you know that fine edge between perfection is equipment really and making sure that it works correctly yeah yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, so as it, it is the foundation of your performance, because someone could play brilliantly mm-hmm. and their instrument really sounds poor and, and someone else comes up and plays something a little easier, and maybe not so well, but in a really nice instrument, it, it just sounds so much better. That's it. Tone is king. I think we've said that on the show before. <laughs> Tone is absolute king, yeah. <laughs> so whenever you're striving to get that tone, you know, um, obviously conditions and everything come into it. We've got quite a number of folk we listen to the show from the US and you've traveled around the globe with your plane. Has there been any one moment that you've really struggled with the conditions? Probably. Um, we're, we're very lucky in the part of the world that we live in. Yeah, both yourself will be the same that the humid- humidity level is, is fairly high and fairly constant. And I say to people, who live in dry parts of the world, even when it's really dry weather here, it's still pretty wet. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so traveling to places um, in the winter in the US, uh, particularly the dryness is a huge thing. And you've got your instrument set up, of course, in humidity of 50, 50 odd percent maybe, and you go to somewhere where it's 20, it's a huge thing. And, and the, the, the thing that brought it to me um, was the first time I went to Winter Storm in Kansas City, which is a great, great festival. And um, I was due to go on to play in the concert on the Saturday night, and uh, my pipes were just horrible, and the reed was just so horrible because it was so dry. So I ended up um, taking the reed as a last desperate measure, ran it under the tap, the chanter reed, put it back in, let the drips come off the reed, blew through it, put it in, and then went on and played, and it was fine because wow. all of a sudden I'd just get some moisture into the blades and, and it started to go a bit better. So that was a bit of a relief. It could have went horribly wrong, but it was I was an educated guess, you know. There you go, and hey, if it paid off, then all the better, <laughs> yeah. But it shows even the difference to, you know, when even performers and bands from the US come here to the UK, they have to adjust to our climate too, so... It's really quite interesting to struggle with that, you know? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Mm. Now, we've also got a question as well as being a student of the instrument and constantly learning. Uh, you're also quite a prolific teacher and you've been involved, of course, with many different teaching programs throughout the years. Have you any advice for anyone who's responsible for teaching? 
Patience would be number one, I would say, possibly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think what um, a very good friend of mine, um, uh, the late Pipe Major John McKenzie. I talked with him on a few few occasions, and uh, the very first summer school I did with him, mm -hmm. and he said something to me which I've I've really kind of tried to to stick to, and he said um, it doesn't matter whether the student's going to be one of the one of the, the great players of the future or just someone who's fairly low beginner, he said, um, he says, never send them away with a sorry heart. And um, I thought, you know, that's a really good piece of advice because, you know, people are doing this because they want to learn and because they want to have fun. They don't want to send out, want to walk away feeling bad about themselves. So there's always positives. And I, I think you can be critical, but but still, you know, encouraging, and I, and I think I try to to, to sort of teach that way. Yeah. Um, I'm not I'm not really a shouter in the teaching business, you know. Even <laughs> though sometimes it can be quite frustrating, you know. <laughs> oh, that's I've had my fair share of people who yell at you, and I've even heard the the odd horse, horror story of people getting smacked with chanters and sticks and stuff, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so yeah, I, I but I love that idea of like having positive criticism, you know, and encouraging folks. That's fantastic. So you do use yeah. that yourself then, well, in your own teaching. Yeah, yeah, I think so, and and I think it's it's an important thing. And piping world I also think it's important when people are writing you know crits of competitions to be balanced and fair in that way as well because yeah. again you know you get people who are, are doing their best and maybe maybe having a bad day you know it's you know we all have bad days so yeah. um, I think it's I think it's 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 good to be balanced and fair always that's it indeed so can I ask you then um, we're aware of quite a number of uh, pipers who actually listen to the show and they've asked us for advice about overcoming roadblocks with their playing. Say there's a particular tune that they just can't get and they've been practicing it for weeks. Um, does there any particular roadblocks that you believe are quite common to progress? I think sometimes, um, yeah, we all get frustrated with our technique and stuff like that sometimes. And I think probably it's, you know, that's a major thing usually. Um, so I always say, say and to myself as well students is like if you have a, a movement or an embellishment that you don't think is working quite right just take it back to basics and play it slowly and evenly and open and uh, that's that's one of the things that, that can can make the tune better of course but with learning tunes I always think it's just about re repetition but getting the Getting the tune in your head, so it may it may mean you're walking around the house singing it instead of just playing it, and yeah. and I think that's a really important part that we sometimes forget about because you know the the, the instrument was I mean if we were 150 years ago we wouldn't be using music we'd be teaching just from singing and that's and it. demonstrating and yeah. and I think probably if you can use that method to to um, learn tunes then then you can definitely get the music out of them better and you can memorize them better. They are. That's interesting. Because it brings me on to what I wanted to talk to you about, actually, from my own perspective, is practice. I've got pretty limited time, and I'm sure a lot of folks listening to the show are the same. And you've been famously quoted a number of times talking about focused practice, not the quantity yeah. of it, playing for hours and hours and hours. But if you can do 10, 20 minutes where you're really concentrating, is that still the case? Well, are you still a, a fan of that idea? Absolutely, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm probably not what would be called a long practicer <laughs> in terms of like I don't play my pipes for hours or chanter for hours. But yeah. as you, I mean, it's nice to know that <laughs> people have quoted me on that. But yes, I think that quality <laughs> is always better than, than quantity. Um, my dad was a great believer in, in, in you know, just you know, playing with focus and uh, so was my Uncle Ronald and, and they, I mean, he would always say if you're just going to play and just play through tunes, just yeah. don't even bother. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, like play with focus and, and with some sort of um, concentration on what you want to do. So, yeah, I mean, even when I, when I do my practice now, as soon as the pipes are on my shoulder, I'm switched on, even if I'm just playing a warm-up set of three, four matches or something like that. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to make them the best they can be. You know, it's it's almost almost as well. I, I just want to get to that standard 
right from the start you know it doesn't always happen that way but if you're trying if it it's, it helps me focus when i'm up up in the boards as well i think just being so in the moment so if i practice for whether it's 10 15 minutes or 45 minutes i try to be so focused what i do yeah. and and do the whole practice with purpose so i've i've got a plan before i've even got the pipes in the shoulder i know what i'm going to do in that practice session so if I'm going to be doing master speeds and reels or P-Brooks or a bit of both, I know exactly what ones I'm going to do and exactly how many times I'm going to play them. So it, it's just like there's a plan, you know. It's not always written down, but it's a plan, you know. Yeah, you know a way forward and you're not just like phoning it in, that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because I know many players out there, and I'm going to throw all my mates under the bus, who would do their practice sitting watching the TV. You know, they'll have the TV on and they're playing away of the sticks and the chatter and they're not really focusing on what they're doing. So I think that's sound advice there, Wally, for sure. Yeah. Thanks. So I have to say, well, you're now going to be busy in preparation. In a few days, you're going to be treading the boards, like you say. Yeah. The Can I ask then, how many appearances is this for you now at the championships? Um, well, I think this would be my possibly the 32nd one. I think that's what it is. Uh, that's incredible. So it's been- yeah. It's been a it's been a few right enough. <laughs> <laughs> and certainly you've won it quite a few times as well. <laughs> so can I ask then, does I know this is kind of a, a weird question, but does it ever get old? You know, th- that first t- experience with you walking through the doors is bound to stick with you as an experience you'll never forget. But even this weekend, stepping through the doors of Blair Castle, is it still gonna be that wow moment for you? Uh, I know it will be. It's a it's a special place to play. It's a big event. Um, I I remember the first time I ever went to the event as a spectator, as a as a teenager, and just being in the hall. Um, I was there with my father and and play major Ronnie McCallum, mm-hmm. um, and whose grandson at the moment is a holder of the competition, Stuart Liddell. And I sat and listened to all these great players like um, Pi Major Angus MacDonald and uh, John Burgess, uh, Ian McFadgen and people like that. And it was like just a special moment. Of course, my uncle Hugh McCallum was playing. Um, so some great players there and uh, just, you know, the best of the best. And, and I remember saying to my dad, I'd love to play here someday. So... It was it was nice to get the chance, and I always remembered how chuffed I was when I got the invite the first time, and uh, that was special. Um, but I know that every time I go up, I think, well, this might this might be the last time I play in here, so try and enjoy it and try and play well, you know. I see. Yeah. Well, hopefully, it won't be many more to come for sure. <laughs> yeah. So we need to get into the whole geekiness and the nerdiness of this. We have a lot of pipers listening right now, and they'll be fascinated in your process of preparation. Now, the Glenfiddich is not an easy championship to prepare for because you have two performances here with a whole range of tunes. So how many p is it and how many Marchester Spay and Reels you need to select here? Right, well, it's um, six p of your own choice and six Marches to Spays and Reels. And you play... The match has been real twice through the same tune twice. Oh, right, yeah, all right. So it's not just a simple case of doing what you would do in your band. It's <laughs> it's twice through for each. That's a it's, serious amount of concentration yeah. involved in that as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is. It is. It's a uh, yeah. It's 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 a tough one. I think mm. um, some of the competitions when it's a double MSR, it's two tunes of each. Um, but I find the the twice through is a bigger test. I, I don't know why it is, but it just seems that way. So I do prepare for that um, quite quite rigorously, I think. Um, it was Captain John McClellan that told me I should practice three times through each March. Um, it's just right. being real. Yeah. Um, I couldn't do that every day because there's not enough hours in the day to do that. <laughs> but I do have, I do have that um, as part of... Well, once I go off the the Zoom call uh, from yourself, uh, I'll be doing three of each three times through uh, today, and the other three three times through tomorrow. That's my that's my usual routine the weekend before, um, and it's just building that building that practice up. You know, I'll not be doing the Pebrooks three times through. I think 
that would be extreme, you know. If I get through them once each, I'll be happy over the weekend, you know. Yeah, that's it. And if anything, from from a memorization point of view as well, like you said, even when the instrument's not on your hand or the pipe's on the shoulder, you're singing through them and you're always kind of going through that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. And then as far as tune selection goes, you submit all of your tunes and you don't actually find out what you're supposed to play until the Friday night before. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Friday night, um, six o'clock, I think it is. We're getting the email. So wow. <laughs> that doesn't give you long. You know, even that adds a bit of extra pressure too, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I, I think most of the people that are playing and I think I would include them all in it have done this kind of, MSR before mm. uh, at the championship itself so they kind of know what's involved and probably then mentally they're able to handle it quite well um, I remember the first time I did a first, a twice through um, March of Spain and, Neil, and I remember it well, it was the mod in Edinburgh in 1986 it's, it's etched on my mind because I thought I thought I knew what I was doing. Oh, no. <laughs> and when I got up there to play twice through, I realised I didn't really know what I was doing, you know. Oh, so man. so it was always one of these uh, learning curves, you know. And I think probably it took me quite a few double MSRs to to get really get the, my head around yeah. it. Get into the whole swing of it, really. Yeah, yeah. So can I ask you then about your actual equipment? Uh, I remember speaking to, I think it was Bruce Gandhi on the show before, he talks about when he goes over, he actually takes like three chanters with him and he would try to get all three of them going and then on the Saturday he would lift one that he's happy with. As far as yourself and equipment and all the rest, what was your setup then, Molly, for this weekend? Uh, well, B, um, the set of pipes I've had, I've played since I was 11 and it's a set of Hendersons from the 1890s and yeah. they've been in the family for a, a, a long, long time. Uh, since I think the 1930s, um, yeah. and um, they were uh, they were played by my uncle Ronald, who was my main teacher when I was growing up, and uh, I I was passed them on uh, by him. So my grandfather bought them all all these years ago. So so I'll be playing them. I've always played them almost exclusively in in the UK competitions. Um, so yeah, I play them um, and uh, I play a, a, a McCallum MC Squared Chanter, which was designed by myself. Yeah. At the moment, I'm playing, still playing the very first one I got, um, but I have three on the go, which, which I might, one of them would be a backup, but the main one, the main one is, uh, at the moment, is the, is the original one I played. Um, so I, I enjoy it. I just I just like what I'm getting out of that at the moment. So there that's the one I'll, I'll probably play on on Saturday, and then I play a I play a synthetic bag, which is a a, a Banatine um, hide yeah, a hybrid nice. bag, and uh, just to keep my drones dry, I use the dry flow uh, drone tubes, yeah. and that that just guarantees that if um, if there's a moisture issue, it's not going to affect the steadiness. Not going to happen. No. <laughs> yeah. And then I play a, a Donald McPhee chant to read. I've been using Donald's reads for yeah. more than 20 years, probably about 25 years now. So um, it's served, served me pretty well. And uh, my drone reads are uh, easy drone reads. Yeah, that's a very popular choice. Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of the folks listening to the pod right now will actually be taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> you know? well, a lot of people are using that these systems maybe anyway so but yeah i mean it suits me it does you know i think it's all individual you know every, everybody's setup is so different and we all blow differently and we blow different amounts of moisture into the pipe so it's, it's a battle just to get the right setup you know oh, for sure and then even the venue itself we've been told about the conditions from the tuning room up that hallway onto the stage, there's differences in temperature and things, and a lot of things you have to consider there, Well, yeah. Yeah, I think that's just the experience thing. I think that can be the, the case at any competition. Um, yeah. If you get an early morning draw, if the heating, if it's a cold day outside, the heating's not come up maybe so much, so mm -hmm. you have to be kind of just careful with that um, if it's a bit cooler, but... But by the end of the afternoon, it's almost like the other way around, and it you walk in and you can just you can just feel the heat and you can feel the moisture and you can feel 
the electricity in the air if you're on late in the March of Spain Rail. So you've got both both ends of the of the, the thing there, really, you know. That's it. So can I ask then, what's it like backstage? Because us watching it at home, or for those of us who've been there, we only get to see what happens on stage and in the main hall. But backstage, is it frantic with people running about or is it very calm and relaxed? What's it like? It's pretty it's pretty calm, I would say. All the all the all the, the people who are playing in it are pretty much uh, knowing each other and really good friends, you know. So we're all kind of willing each other to play well, you know, and obviously we're wanting to play well ourselves. Mm-hmm. It's a very sporting um thing I, I find the piping world I think um, I'm, I'm good friends with all the, the people who are playing it and playing against and uh, you know you just want everyone to play well and then see what, what happens really you know so because we're all in the same boat really but uh, it's pretty relaxed you know there's a lot of pacing up and down right enough I have to say you know? there's, <laughs> there's carpets worn out in an afternoon you know <laughs> uh, but yeah you're just trying to kind of keep yourself from getting too nervous, I think. I think that's it. We're all nervous. I mean, uh, doing it for this long, you would think you would get better at that, but the nerves are still play a part. So, yeah. you, you like a little nerves, but you you just don't want to be completely consumed by them. You know. No, oh, that's it. And I, I think people have come on the show before, you know, performing at world championships, and says that you need that edge. Like the the nervousness kind of gives you an edge of concentration there. I suppose. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So, Ollie, what's it like then on stage? Whenever you have them on your shoulder, you're going, you're tuning up, getting ready. What's it like up there with, you know, being on that stage? <laughs> um, I think probably the worst bit is just you getting tuned up and ready to actually start your performance. I think you walk in and you, and you just, I suppose you just get yourself into a bubble of concentration and, uh, yes. and, uh, just you know, you just know you're going to have to get on with it. You know the 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 the, the hour cometh. You know, and uh, I, I think I think yeah, I think you just you, you kind of get yourself into a, a state where you you want to be ready to play. So it's just most of it. Most of the thing is that rather than tuning the instrument, although you obviously have to get your drones in the right place for for starting the performance. But uh, yeah, it's it's in every place. Uh, and and I think probably you don't want to take note of too many things that are around you because there's a lot of yeah, there's a lot that's of things it. on that stage, you know, there's a Neil Gow's fiddle and there's a portrait and there's a big bull's head at the back and yeah. there's a piano with a with a trophy on it and all that and you're just trying to just trying to just play in a bubble that you don't see anything, you know. Because <laughs> uh, that's so, so much up there to distract you. And, you know, us as viewers, we can go look, watch it and go, oh, look at that, and that's cool, look at that. I'm sure as a player, it's bound to catch your eye, you know. They are, I suppose, yeah. I mean, and, and again, it's maybe like having done it a few times, you, you hope you know where everything is. You, uh, just hope, uh, you just hope nobody's moved anything, you know. <laughs> uh, but I suppose, I suppose we'll all be just kind of, concentrating when practicing this week and imagining yourself up there. I think that visualization helps you during the week just to to make it kind of normal when you get up there. Certainly, yeah. And picturing yourself there indeed. No, that'd be invaluable for sure. Uh, so when it's all over and you've played your set and your work for the day is done, we've heard some famous stories about the Cayley that happens afterwards. Uh, can you tell us? I know some things that happen in the Cayley stay in the Cayley, but is it as good crack as everyone says it is? Um, it is actually. Yeah, it's not as maybe not as late as it, it was in earlier times. I can remember some um, some nights where people were maybe just going from the bar to get their breakfast and go to bed. Um, <laughs> but uh, and, I, and I can't mention any names. But yeah, there have been a few late nights uh, for sure. Uh, it's a bit more sensible now, um, I would I would say uh, definitely. But uh, no, it's some great crack, and uh, sometimes I sometimes I feel you're just so drained by it, you know, when you get down the road because it's it's a huge kind of emotional thing to play up there and the nerves and all that. You just sometimes you just want to go and have a lie down for an hour before you do anything. You know? So, but it's a good night to, to let off some steam, and it's great to catch up with people. Some people you haven't seen for ages. So the Kaylee's great, um, and uh, 
uh, yeah, we can, you can have a laugh with your friends, you know. That's it. And uh, yeah, if any if anyone wants to get tickets for that, I think they are still available. So yeah, that definitely to be experienced. So I have to say, for everyone who wants to watch Willie do the business this weekend, tickets are available now through the National Piping Centre's website. You can go grab your tickets for the live stream. I think it's 15 quid. And then even if you don't happen to watch it live, you can watch it up to seven days after the original broadcast. So absolutely brilliant. Yeah. So well, I, I've got a number of big rab show staples I have to ask you before I let you go. Okay. Um, but first of all, I want to find out about the man behind, you know, the piping, if you know what I mean. Have, yeah. you, any, have you any interests outside of piping? Uh, a few, yeah. Um, I suppose um, I suppose most people know that uh, football is a big passion for me. So yeah. um, I'm, a, I'm a season ticket holder at, at the, the Rangers, of course. So um, that's um, that's uh, that's a big passion in life. And uh, yeah, it's it, it, I've, it's one of these things that you you grow up. I, I played a lot of football when I was young, and uh, that was my team. So yeah, I'm I'm there. Quite regularly, so um, yeah, yeah, that's that's a big thing, and I suppose just like just um, I'm kind of a bit of a TV addict as well. So uh, yeah. anything, anything, and everything, you know, and and it's been invaluable over the COVID lockdown. So I think right. I think people, most people, have consumed a lot of Netflix and Amazon Prime over that time, and yeah. watched things they'd never thought they would watch, you know. <laughs> Oh, for sure. Yeah, I find myself watching superhero movies and all sorts. Yeah, it's been crazy. Um, so obviously, well, I hope you don't mind me saying, but a lot of folks would look to you as an inspirational figure in the piping scene, saying that they would love to be able to play like you. Can I ask then, who inspires you? Is there anyone you look to and thinking, you know, I love their playing? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, it's very nice that people think that way, and 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 I'm I'm so. Um, flattered by that because it, it, it doesn't seem like that I just you always I suppose as a pirate you just do what you do um, <laughs> um, but yeah I mean I, I had a lot of heroes growing up um, when I was little I was very fortunate in Campbelltown when I the, the entire piping society um, had a lot of great recitalists came to Campbelltown to play so um, believe it or not, um, when I was a young boy, I, I heard uh, Donald McLeod and Donald McPherson, wow. John Burgess, yeah. Hugh McCallum, Ian McFadgen, John McFadgen. I mean, the list is John McDougall, just the great, great players. Um, yeah. And and so that was, every one of them was, was a hero to me. And, and when I, when I kind of got a bit older and went to competitions, just even to listen to the, to the sort of big guys, um, I, I really liked to listen to Angus MacDonald and Ian Morrison and John Wilson. I think they're all great players, you know. And so you kind of, you kind of, kind of aspire to be, you know, in that kind of uh, group of great players. That was that was the one thing. And when when I when I went from the junior piping into senior piping, I was amazed at the standard of these guys because. You were seeing them up close because you were competing against them. Um, yeah. Because there was no graded competition, so you went to Highland Games and it was you were up against the best of the best, which was great, you know, because you saw them and you looked at them and you said, you know, how good is he? You know, I used to watch Murray Henderson, a great player and a great friend, just magic player, you know, just and and very musical. Um, I suppose amongst my contemporaries, I would I would say that Roddy McLeod, uh, as well as being a great friend, you know his his instrument and his playing is 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 great to listen to. So yeah, you take you take a lot of the things that these people do, and 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 uh, I I think you you just try to kind of you know add to your game by learning of them. You know. There you go. No, that's a fantastic answer. Yeah. So can I ask as well, now we've asked this of many in the top flight, you know, in the band scene, but I want to ask folk in the solo scene, have you ever played what you would describe as being the perfect set? Has there ever been a moment where you thought that was flawless? It's very rare that you, there's always something that annoys you. <laughs> you know, you come off, even when you think you played well, you, you know, you might say, well, I don't know if I get that Dublin, one Dublin out of a, uh, or whatever, you know, um, there's a couple of times where I've come off and, and been really happy, but you know these things are 
if you get one in a whole season, you're lucky, you know. And you um, I, I suppose, um, yeah, there's been no people here and there, you know, playing playing big tunes, and you get up and you go like that. All went to plan, but it, yeah, it's, yeah, there's not been many, really. You would say. Um, I think last year was a really hard uh, one. I, I thought when I finished my March to Spain, really, I was really happy with it because. It had been a really hard year, you know, not yeah. not having in to play at, and all of a sudden you're at the biggest competition in the world, <laughs> yeah. um, um, and trying to get up to a level. So I, I, I suppose that was really satisfying because I worked like like nobody's business to get uh, to where yeah. I where I got on the day, you know, and and even the week before I wasn't sure I was going to be able to do that, you know. So I suppose that one was was one of them that I would remember for that reason. You, know? you are fantastic. So we're always striving for perfection. I think that's it. Yeah, absolutely. Indeed. Yeah. So well, I, I'm going to leave you now with a couple of questions um, that we always okay. ask every guest that comes on. So unfortunately, you're not going to avoid it. Um, is there any one particular moment throughout all of your career in piping that stands out to yourself as its most memorable? Now, this could be for a good reason or a bad reason. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I suppose you try to forget the bad ones. Um, there's, there's been there's been plenty of them as well. Um, I, I suppose um, it's very very difficult to to think of it, but I, I suppose, and it relates maybe to the Glen Fiddich that um, the first time I won the competition. Um, yeah, it, it was. I mean, I went up to the competition to. Um, just to take part, you know, um, it was maybe, I think it was maybe the third or fourth time I'd played in it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like, I just thought, like, I, I suppose I, when I won it, I thought, I, you've no right to win this, you're not ready to do that yet. You know, it's a funny, <laughs> funny feeling. But it was a, it was one of these weeks that um, it was a very kind of uh, poetic thing because uh, my mother had, taken not well and she'd been in hospital just before it and uh, and so her and my dad weren't able to go so um, I suppose that sticks out because I remember going down down the road on the Sunday and going straight to the hospital with a trophy um, oh, wow. and it was quite an emotional moment you know yeah oh for sure so even when I think about it now it's, it's kind of mm. it's kind of nice you know so their their face just to see their faces you know that's it. And so that, that kind of stands out, you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. That was a fantastic answer. Yeah. So I don't know how to go from there. I need to ask you <laughs> the, the big question that we ask every guest. So, Wally McCallum, what's your favorite cheese? My favorite cheese. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> I suppose, I suppose, um, Stilton. There you go. Oh, good Stilton. You can't beat a good Stilton now. Ah, uh, uh, there you go. There you are. Good answer, indeed. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I have to say, I wish you the very best of luck this upcoming weekend. We'll all be watching, I'm sure, during over the live stream and such. And again, just to remind folks, if you do want to grab tickets for it, go to the Pipe and Centre's website. They are available up there. Uh, it's 15 quid and cheap at twice the price, honestly. So this is going to be a fantastic event. So have you any parting words of wisdom, Wally, before we say our cheerios or... Uh, well, I've really enjoyed the interview, and uh, uh, thanks for having me on, Rob. Um, I think probably no. I think um, I think people should just like love piping and enjoy it, you know. Right. And, and uh, anyone who's anyone who knows me would say just practice until you you get better, you know. It, it kind of works, you know. That's just, that's <laughs> it's just a funny thing, you know. You you practice a bit more, you get better. So um, that's it. I know it's the old cliche, but practice makes perfect. Indeed, yeah. Indeed. Well, hey, thank you so much for joining us on the show. And hopefully we'll chat to you again sometime. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thanks very much.